Welcome to the Korea Society's live webcast. I'm Jayo, Senior Director of Arts and Culture. It is hard to believe or even to admit that we have been living in this quote unquote new normal for almost a year now. Almost exactly one year ago in March, 2020, New York, the city and the state were put on a pause when all non-essential business were ordered to shut down and discontinue in-person services. Every aspect of our lives were affected by it and disrupted by it, and it still remains so. Many businesses had to shut down temporarily or permanently, and in order to survive, they had to reconfigure and pivot that word of 2020, combining flexibility and ingenuity. And if there is one industry that had to constantly deal with ever-changing regulations and restrictions while trying to pivot, it is the restaurants and food industry, especially in New York City. We are thrilled to welcome three very busy restaurateurs who also happen to be great friends of the Korea Society over the years and to hear about what their year has been like and their plans and hope for the future. Christina Zhang is the owner and operator of New Wanjo, a restaurant in the heart of Koreatown in New York City. Simon Kim Hi. is the proprietor of Coat in New York and Coat Miami, now open in Miami's design district. And Ray really? Park is the founder of Red Pokey, a Korea, Korean fast casual restaurant in New York, and Soul Fried Chicken Co., which just opened in Edison, New Jersey. So welcome back to the Korea Society, Christina, Simon, and Ray. Thank you so much for joining us Pleasure tonight. Nice meeting you. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so Ray. much for having Thank us. A quick reminder to our viewers, you can send your questions via Twitter at koreasocietyart or email artsandculture at koreasociety.org. So Simon, I want to start with you because almost exactly a year ago, February of 2020, when we, before the whole world changed, <laughs> we were still able to gather at our public space at the Korea Society. We had a wonderful program um, with you and other Korean American restaurateurs in um, New York City. Feels like that was 10 years ago. Right, it was <laughs> only a year ago. Um, and we talked briefly at the beginning um, about this thing that we kept hearing about, this virus that was coming. Um, let's just think a little bit back to that February of 2020, which feels like 10 years ago. Do, did you have any inclination of what was coming? Was there any sign that it was spreading perhaps among your workers or um, was there any signs of business slowing down? Um, what do you, I know this, it feels like that's a lifetime ago, but how was, yeah. how was it in February of 2020? Hmm. So first of all, thanks, thanks to the viewers for tuning in. Thank you very much. Uh, so, so again, it feels like that was so long ago, but I feel like as a Korean American, I think we had a little bit of an advantage, right? Because I knew because both my parents and my in-laws are in Korea. So we were monitoring that really uh, carefully. And in Asia, it happened much quicker. And at that point, we knew that this was very different than previous um, uh, viral disease like MERS, SARS. You know, those are all kind of Asia specific. They never really kind of became a global pandemic. But I knew uh, COVID was a little different because things were, you know, getting out of control. So I think that was really, really helpful. So. Around February, we actually got together with our partners and our uh, managers, and we talked about this is getting serious. We do think that it's going to come to New York. How are we going to prepare? And at that point, we have determined, uh, despite some of the partners were against um, doing delivery because it's kind of off-brand, mm -hmm. how do you deliver, you know, um, you know, mm -hmm. fine dining Korean barbecue tabletop to home? So there was a little bit of pushback, but we have determined that we're going to do this. And we actually had all the packaging and all those ideas kind of uh, in the pipeline. And also, I have a, a very good mentor. He used to be chief people officer of WeWork. So he was, um, and him and I had a conversation and he was like, Simon, like, I understand, 
you know, restaurants. You don't close that under any circumstances, right? Like I think Ray and Christina, you all agree. If it snows, yeah. we shovel through the snow. If it rains, doesn't matter what happens. We open our restaurant, right? I think that's the thing. And he actually uh, mentioned that, Simon, this is actually going to be very different. So mm. we actually were planning on voluntarily shutting it down. So I feel like we were very fortunate in being, you know, just uh, one step uh, ahead. So I'm, I feel very grateful. Having mm. that Asian uh, Korean heritage really helped us. Mm. How about you, Christina? Was there any buzz going around in the Koreatown about the virus? Were people getting a little nervous or were people a little bit apprehensive about what was going to happen? Definitely, I could have felt uh, because, you know, the sales actually showed us. Mm -hmm. um, when I heard the news that uh, coronavirus was spreading in China, um, I saw like about 20 to 30 percent of the sales dropped compared to the previous year because we are located in a key town where the most uh, Asian people are coming. So that's why we could have failed. And then after that, uh, like a couple of weeks later, I heard the news that uh, the coronavirus is spreading in Korea too. And dramatically, like every week, every day, the sale like it dropped 10%, 20%. So before the shutdown, our sale was like about 20% of uh, uh, sales uh, compared to the previous year. So in a month, like a dropping dramatically. Wow. Okay. How about you, Ray? Your business is slightly different, obviously. Did you see anything different or were there any concerns from your workers or anything like that? Yeah, at that time, I still remember that uh, it was the second week of March that because uh, we've been uh, watching news, uh, what's going on in China and Korea, right? And but I think at that time I just wish that it's not coming here, right? So I didn't, I was not, also I didn't uh, talk to my team member about that. I don't want to just cause any kind of like the bad atmosphere. And then the first week, like going like that. And then second week was uh, dropping down crazy. To be honest with you, I had no idea about uh, what to do at that time. Um, we have a uh, tons of members in the restaurant. Uh, people then are coming in and then we see the volume. We, are, uh, we have two restaurants located in uh, Times Square. So, you know, it was all the time packed and busy and uh, rapidly it's gone. So uh, we see just a few people on the street. Everybody was at times scared to touch each other and the, like, you know, even like see it like that, right? So uh, yeah, that time that uh, I talked to our team members that, hey, you know, this is what we're gonna do. It's dangerous. So if you want to stay home, stay home. Uh, this is what it is. And half of team members, they were afraid to come to work. So we closed one location and maybe in five days after we just closed the entire restaurant we had to that time. So that March of 2020, um, restaurant business is notorious for um, working with very, very thin margins. Um, so when the pause happened, and you are basically ordered to shut down, whether voluntarily or involuntarily. Was there any safety net available for you and your employees? Or how did you manage to sort of, you know, figure out, okay, and nobody knew how long you guys are going to be closed, right? It was just at first we all thought, Maybe it will be two weeks, maybe it will be a month. Nobody really expected that it would last as long as it had, and it's still lasting. So what was your sort of, if there was one, what was your sort of the safety net? How did you decide to deal with things financially and still take care of your business and your employees? How about, um, why don't we start with Simon? Mm, when we're, Honestly, as we keep, keep mentioning, you know, as a restaurant to a restaurant owner, closing down a restaurant is just unthinkable thing, right? It's uh, literally where it's a high, high, very intense, uh, labor intensive business. So we always show up to work. That's our, that's our like way of life. And when we got shut down, we had to, we had 105 employees and basically overnight, I, had to, I remember vividly, I, it was a Sunday night, so we got everyone into the kitchen, middle of service. There's um, diners outside, and we're basically letting them know, hey, like, 
everybody's getting laid off. And that was probably the most, you know, probably saddest moment because it's involuntarily, it, it almost felt like euthanizing your own pet, right? Like mm. when, it, the, when the pet is perfectly fine, so somehow. Anyway, so that was really devastating. And of course, there was no, there was no safety net, right? Like restaurant is a pay, paycheck to paycheck. And in fact, you actually have uh, pay, accounts payable 30 days out, right? So if you stop now, it's not like you actually have more money to pay. So it was really, really difficult. But we are in a March was not a, not the worst time for us. I mean, you know, on a grand scheme of things, because we had a investor distribution that we were holding on to, because that's March after March, I would dis dispute dispute that. So we were sitting on a little bit of cash reserve. So when we're forced to shut down, um, we had a little bit of cash, and we we didn't. Th I mean, we thought that hey, the government's going to shut us down. They're going to come and rescue us, right? You can't like. You know, we live in New York City, the greatest city in the world. You know, of course, the government's going to come and bail us out. This is not, and we didn't do anything wrong. So initially, little did I know. So I actually started giving a little bit of money away to um, my, our employees. You know, every week I give, you know, a couple hundred dollars to our employees who were not receiving uh, unemployment and whatnot. But um, and because we thought the rescue is going to come, come and we're going to reopen soon. And I think that's how it happened. And um but as far as safety net i thought we had it but literally there was nothing but what was actually really amazing was that our customers started to really kind of uh, step in you know we had a gofundme uh page where we raised over fifty thousand dollars for our employees uh we had sold gift cards and whatnot so those kind of um uh help was really really uh heartfelt mm. That's nice to hear. How about you, Christina? What was it like that first month? Exactly the same as Simon. Actually, we didn't know what to do because all of a sudden we had to close down our business. Um, only takeout allowed. And as you mentioned, the takeout is not our main uh, main thing. So, uh, But we had to adjust ourselves to uh, survive. So we uh, changed our steps to schedule. Like we have more than 50 and 60 employees, but we had to, uh, we had to come down to three to four employees a day. Wow. So, uh, we, so we had to temporarily uh, follow um, our all employees. And then, um, you know, we had to let them apply for the, uh, the unemployment insurance. That's what we could do at that time. It was a sad, but that, that was the best choice for them. So that's what we did. And as Simon said, we didn't have a safe net. It, this is like a restaurant business uh, nature. I mean, we sell like a $10, $20, $30 dish. Um, and then uh, we have to pay um, the vendors and uh, the employees and uh, everything, the suppliers. And so uh, we, we, we sell and we pay. This is like only 30 days, like a circulation. That's the cycle of the restaurant business. So we didn't have a safe net at all. We thought that we have, oh, we have a reserve the money a little bit, but then we had to pay the rent, the full rent, even though we ask our landlord. I mean, we understand that he's in a hardship too. So we had to pay the rent and uh, paying the, the checks every week. So at the end, we saw end of the March, we didn't see much. So uh, yeah, that, that was the situation for us. And Ray was pretty similar with the year case too, in terms of your business? Yeah, um, yeah they already went over that. So it was, of course, we are yeah. same. And so we closed, uh, so at the end of the second week of March, we closed first location. And then also five days after we closed the other location. Then, um, so for five weeks by April, uh, third week, uh, we were closed and uh, I was uh, uh, sitting at home all the time, didn't go out and checking the, uh, all the news, tried to learn what's going on, what I had to do. And I was, uh, of course, our employees like the uh, unemployment and anything that I have information, I just send it out. We're using WhatsApp to communicate. So I just uh, let them know what's, uh, this is the good information for you guys. But I was asking them, hey, you guys, uh, anybody want to uh, come back? And uh, two people replied. Uh, like in 
different chatting room that, hey, you know, I'm ready. It was uh, one chef and one cook and the one delivery guy. So uh, me, because I couldn't just uh, sit down at home all the time, no matter what's going on outside. So we just two, uh, came back to the restaurant, uh, 43rd Street location. We, three of us, we just reopened that time. Yeah. Yeah. And the numbers were really scary. According to an estimate from the National Restaurant Association, an estimated 30,000 U.S. restaurants had already closed for good. Um, and more than 110,000 were expected to close down by April. So that's, it's almost like hard to imagine the magnitude of the closures that were happening. So you mentioned, Simon, a little bit about how heartwarming it was for you to see your customers um, support you, but I'm sure it was just a ridiculously, it, it was a difficult time for everyone, but especially as a business owner who has to make all these decisions, I'm sure it was particularly um, difficult time because it's not just about your business, you're also thinking about your employees and um, people who work for you. So how, how did you do it? How did you, you know, survive that first few months just, um, you know, that very bleak periods of, uh, you know, just mentally, physically, financially, you know, personally, business-wise, how did you do it? What, what made you keep going? Because you guys are, yeah. you know, spoiler alert, but you guys are keep going. So you're not one of these many restaurants who shut down. So sure. Yeah, uh, Jay, we pushed, honestly, I don't exactly know, right? I don't think I can pinpoint how I did it. I think it's just, I took it one day at a time. I think when the crisis happened, you know, I, first of all, I started to breathe. You know, I think it's very important to breathe, breathe well, you know, because when it gets so shocked, I think you stop breathing and that's when things shut down. So, you know, first I tried to breathe and I was like, okay, one day at a time. And what, what, what we need to do is, you know, my management employees all had families, dependents, mortgage payments, and, and they had more than anything else gave us the loyalty, right? They were loyal to us. So how do I keep these people employed, right? Because unemployment of uh, whatever the, 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 the paycheck they were getting from insurance was not gonna cut it. So how do we protect as many, you know, the boat is sinking, how do we actually pedal as fast as possible to land to a land and keep as many uh, crew members on the boat was the only thing that was in my head, right? There's nothing else. So that was really actually, that's the moment where it got very clear, you know, just um, that's what we need to do. That's the mission. And things started to become a little more clear, you know, things were going crazy, but what do I need to do? And we realized that only way we can do this is create more revenue. You know, because because at the end of the day, I got to pay these people. So I got to make more money. And I had multiple meetings with them. It was actually kind of, um, you know, probably the best um, team building experience possible because there was no customers. It was just us. And I remember it was literally, you know, by far, without any comparison, number one most challenging experience that I have done in my entire life. And I can actually bet that it would be the most difficult thing, you know, knock on wood, uh, the most difficult thing in our, in, in, our, in my li lifetime, and I had a I had COVID, you know, back in April when things were really bad. So I was sick for two weeks. That's when I sent my family to Korea. So I was home by home alone, sick. But um, so we're just surviving. But when it really clicked is when we actually started um, delivering food to the frontline workers, you know. So that's when everything kind of shifted. Before. All my chef managers were like, Simon's fucking crazy. Oh, part of my French. But um, <laughs> that's like, this guy's crazy. But I wanted to just keep going to keep everyone employed. And when, um, when we had a partnership with the frontline workers where we were actually making food and delivering it to hospitals where frontline workers, you know, the, like, mind you, we were very scared, but we're sending food to people who are actually surrounded by hundreds of uh, confirmed people who are sick. So that actually kind of made perspective really kind of, actually, we are actually one of the fortunate ones, even though we're restaurant workers. And I think that kind of really kind of uh, a clicked. And then from then on, I think uh, we came together as a team 
and one thing led to another. So I think that that's um, what really helped us carry on. That's great. That's really inspiring uh, um, that you, even within those difficult times you are having, you are able to have that perspective. Um, how about you, Christina? What was, how, how did you sort of survive that whole, that few months of just, where it just seemed like there's no hope? Yeah, I mean, I didn't even have a think about anything, like Simon said, you know, whatever, I mean, no matter what we had to survive. So uh, I just did whatever I could do, working seven days. I think it's Simon and Ray, um, they both did it, I think. And uh, doing uh, whatever I could and in the restaurant because we have only three, four people. And then I was like a preparing. I never uh, cooked in my restaurant, but I was like a, in a kitchen and helped the, pre uh, the preparation and uh, sometimes doing a dishwashing and um, sometimes a cashier and packing the, the side of dishes. So like all over the place, but not only me, but all employees were like that, like a manager. It's not a manager position, it's not a manager. He had to do everything. Um, and that's what we did. And just time passed. And then one day I was taking a shower and then I saw the, uh, the handful of the hair uh, fall out, um, like uh, almost uh, one week. And then I saw the like a big mole kind of things on my skin, like my palm side. So I went to a doctor and the doctor said, oh, you have uh, the immune system really down and maybe it's from the stress. Until that time, I didn't know I have that much stress. So I was like, I took a um, medicine and it was okay. But, you know, every day was stressful like that. But we didn't even have a time to think about it. That was the uh, how uh, frustrated we were at the time. So we kind of do um, um, whatever the government allowed, like a takeout and delivery. And we did a uh, milk kit, which we didn't do uh, before the pandemic. And we thought about it. We didn't have a time to start, but um, my husband and I, maybe it's the time to do something uh, new and something we wanted to do. That's why we started a milk kit. Got it. It sounds like you guys went through a war or something. You know, it <laughs> really sounds like you guys went to the battle. Um, and Ray, I would assume that what you went through is very similar to what we just heard. Uh, yeah. So uh, back to April, we back to the restaurant, three of us. And, you know, when I was at home, I just uh, sit down um, in front of a computer. The, uh, the, my head is like exploding back too many things to see and like too many things inside. So it was killing me. That was even harsh, uh, much harder than uh, the situation outside. So uh, back to the restaurant and uh, also that time like uh, make it to like everybody staying at home. So we just create the menus for that. And also we try to make it uh, as uh, simple as possible. Also it was very hard to get a uh, uh, fresh ingredients that time that the also workers for the vendors they didn't come to work too. I guess that maybe they before five days or six days a week delivery. Now, uh, that time it was like two days delivery. So it's really hard to get, uh, keep everything fresh too. So we just uh, change the menus. And also one thing is, uh, so I sat down with the uh, team members that, because we have a free time, uh, no matter what we do in the restaurant, but it was uh, very slow anyway. You know, time scary. area, I took a video of like pretty much every other day because I wanted to skip it as a record and show it to mm. maybe my son or daughter later. And this is what happened, right? And I was like, um, what we can do? Because everybody's distressing and this is just a disaster, right? And uh, our uh, logo is a smiley face. Right. So they're saying that, hey, let's just write some uh, small message on the lead of the mm. ball. So we, because we have a free time. So we write down that uh, like you are not alone, everything will be fine and oh. nothing is impossible. That kind of things. And people take a picture, post it. And some people still staying here. A lot of people, they uh, stay out of a city, right? At time. But some people, regular customer, they appreciate you guys are still alive. And, you know, we chat each other. So yeah, that was the, uh, um, the fun moment. 
uh, when I was, uh, and also that's how the financial thing, everybody's same anyway. We, we have no people to serve, you know, especially our business is relying on, as you see, like Big Green, Sweet Green, or by Chloe, they're also serving mostly office workers and also this area, Bittown, uh tourists. Uh, they are gone, so uh, we, it's out of our hand. So we are thinking that hey, just the people, a few people are staying in the city, we make them happy. So we just write the uh, small message and they, uh, they love it. Mm -hmm. And you know, one funny thing is uh, uh, one of the members, he wrote down the message of, uh, he's supposed to say, you are not alone. And then he's, he wrote down, you are alone. <laughs> so he, and then that ball was delivered to my friend. Who is a oh, no. And then oh, he no. took a picture and then he showed it to me. Hey, what is that? And I was like, oh, then, you know. But anyway, we made somebody laugh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's amazing. It's, yeah, it's that small moments of, you know, of levity that you desperately yeah. probably needed. Um, in terms of adapting to takeouts or meal kits, I would think that Ray, I would assume that for you, yeah. that wasn't like the biggest challenge other than just trying yeah, to get the fresh ingredients and things like that. But how about you for um, Christina? You mentioned that you guys were trying to do meal kits and do delivery, which was not the focus of your business before. So what was what surprised you the most? Um, did you think it would be just kind of similar thing? Or what was the biggest challenge trying to sort of pivot and, um, you know, do a new way of delivering food to your clients? Uh, for the delivering. Um when we started the milk kit, we thought that, oh, I just organized the menu like what I did uh, for the, our dine, uh, you know, the dining customers. But then um, the the response was like, it was it was not uh, it was not as expect, you know, it's not not as good as the uh, expected. So uh, because you know the 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 food in the restaurant is different from the food at home because we have to deliver the food which is suitable for the uh, house cooking so uh, we kind of changed the uh, um, the way of the cooking and the preparation everything the in the restaurant we we boil the soup just and then at the at the moment the chef they uh, put the ingredients just one by one but for the, the milk it wise, we had to do like uh, in advance, we have to think about our customer. And then uh, um, we kind of make the soup with the, all the ingredients. In. So it's a little bit different. We, we right. have to prepare the differently from mm -hmm. the restaurant food. And that was the hard part. Um, that was the challenging. And also the, uh, the organizing menu, um, it's more, um, it's more um, like a calm and not uh, less certy and something, something uh, the mom can cook at home. Mm. So uh, yeah, those are the things mm. that we had to uh, develop uh, differently. Got it. And Simon, it sounds like you actually thought about how to pivot to sort of the delivery and um, shipping service before everything happened. But still, you know, one of the reason people go to high-end restaurant like yours is because it's also the service. Um, so how, what was your biggest challenge when you're trying to tell people, you know, this is worth having it delivered to your home, even though you're not getting the type of service you would expect from a restaurant like Coat. What, so what was your biggest challenge when you are trying to develop, you know, shipping and delivery service for your clients? Sure. So pivoting was really challenging because, you know, at the restaurant, uh, especially fine dining restaurant, we try to, you know, ensure without uh, making it so blatant that we care. Right. Uh, so when you take uh, when your water glass is halfway empty, we re replenish it. You know, when your wine glass is empty, we try to anticipate when you leave for the bathroom, we fold your napkin to to show that we are actually paying attention and we care. And I think the, the amount of care that I can you know, transfer to our customers, the customers are satisfied, right? So when we're pivoting to delivery and takeout and uh, stay care mail order, it's like, how do we do that, right? Because the customer is not here. But so we kind of contemplated and 
it's just it's a little thing, right? Like if I don't fill Jay, if I don't refill your water, it's gonna be fine. The water's on the table, you can just refill it, right? So, but it's a small thing. So we started to kind of zero in on those kind of things. Like for example, you know, when I get takeout, my kind of pet peeve is when, you know, where is the utensil? Utensil is kind of like like somewhere hidden on the on the bottom of the things. It's not easy to find. So we we got a little envelope that and and a little pink envelope with our stamp on it, with our utensils on it, and it was kind of like you know, it was really well, nice bundled, you know? And when I went to Korea for R and D trip, what I saw was I'm at the Korean barbecue restaurant in Korea and they had, um, like on your share plate, there was a little piece of bread, you know, I was like, um, like, what is this bread for? You know? So what they were doing is they actually put the meat and then they put it on top of the top of the bread. So all the blood and, uh, the liquid, would get soaked in. I was like, oh my God, like, let's use that. So whenever people order steak to go, we actually lay two, like, uh, two slices of Wonder Bread. So by the time, and it also helped, you know, steak not become, it can still be crispy and like the, the crust would be intact. And it also provide a plush area. It also kind of uh, conserve heat as well. So we started to like do these small things. And then um, again, we were fortunate enough to keep you know, the majority of our managers and bartender, I mean, uh, principal bartender, and like, how do we actually translate fine dining into delivery? So we made this super cool bespoke cocktail experience. So you can go to these uh, uh, online delivery platform and there's a bespoke cocktail. So, what, so when you click that, we would ask you five different questions. What do you normally drink? You know, Jay, do you drink Negroni, Martini, blah, blah, blah. Do you like citrus? Do you like dry, blah. So you answer those five questions because everyone was scooped up. Everyone was so like, I, I want to go to a restaurant. So they did that and we would get that order real time. And my bartender would make a cocktail right there and then and take a video of it. And then along with the cocktail, they got, so basically it's like going to a bartender, uh, but you can enjoy it at home with the video. So I feel like it was really difficult in the beginning, but I feel like once again, like our team started to adopt to it you know, a lot of creativity kind of came out. Yeah. And that's how you survive, right? Um, just think differently, think outside of the box um, and figure out what would appeal to certain people. Then I guess it was around end of June when it was finally, things were starting to open up a little bit and there was the phase two opening, which allowed outdoor dining um, for the restaurants. For example, for you, Ray, did that make a difference in terms of your business or just, you know, by the virtue of where you are located, you know, because there were just such less traffic and people still working from home and people still not traveling. Um, but at least having that outdoor dining option and people feeling like they can finally get out of the house maybe for the first time in yeah, months yeah. and whether it's getting nice. Um, Did that help happy. you? Yeah, you are happy. No, no not at all. Not at all. No. <laughs> you know, we are delivery, uh, mostly delivery uh, based restaurant, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, once people, they're able to do outdoor dining, even um, I've been living in New York City like 16 years and I miss that kind of uh, small things, right? Just to sit down or at the bar or like outside table and just have mm -hmm. a sip of a cocktails. I miss that kind of a things. And I'm sure there are a lot of people who are staying in the New York City that they were like, you know, I'm waiting for that. So when it happened, everybody just goes to those kind of restaurants, especially when I went to uh, West Village. It's just a different kind of feeling that um, it's very life. So uh, as a customer, I love that. But uh, for Red Pocky that, uh, as I told you, we are uh, mostly, uh, it's a office worker base. So if they're not coming back, then, uh, so let's say, uh, Jay, you're sitting, uh, you're staying at home, right? When you uh, go to work, Korea society, and then you go to the restaurant, like our concept. But if you're living nearby and the Red Pocky is right next to you, you're not gonna go to Red Pocky. You just go to restaurant, like go to uh, like a one job. That's how I found out uh, during pandemic. But uh, mm -hmm. yeah, so Red Pocky, we just keep doing uh, what we have to do. Uh, we just make sure, it's just to uh, core things to make sure that every single ingredient and bonus fine service is good. And then we seal it uh, 
nicely to make sure that you know it's a it's a like you know right but uh, yeah but as a uh, one uh, person who is living in New York City I I I love that sign also my other friends who are running restaurant in New York City they are they need to get some more revenues too right so I I will uh, I was very happy for that that they were able to have some tables outside and they serve people. Mm. But, and also for you too, Christina, I mean, Wonjo is also known for the Korean barbecue and tabletop cooking. So were you able to adapt that into outdoor dining when, or uh, was it just completely different menu that you had to think about? I mean, everybody tends to think that, you know, it's restaurant, so therefore it will be the same thing. But I would think that that wasn't really that easy. That wasn't really the case. What was your experience like with the outdoor dining? Outdoor dining, um, it's a lot of a story, outdoor dining, because there were like a Korea key town, the, um, the open street uh, dr during the weekend. But uh, our customer actually coming for the barbecue and they are coming to New Wonjo and they're expecting the same food. But the new one day, the traditional Korean restaurant, as you know, and then we cook uh, like a barbecue on the grill and uh, doing the casserole at the table, but we couldn't uh, provide that experience to our customer. But we just tried as close as possible. We couldn't change the menu um, much, but we cook on the side way, the barbecue, we, we cook the, uh, the barbecue on the side way. And then uh, we serve the uh, the casserole on the next to the customers. That that's what we did. But the outdoor dining, um, the surprising thing uh, for me was that the uh, not only for one Joe, but the K Town, the the vibe. Um, you know, the I surprised that uh, the Korean people, we our ability to fight uh, with uh, this difficult situation. Like no single <laughs> restaurant permanently closed last year everyone stood there <laughs> together and we kind of created we didn't even um, know like this kind of a vibe we could create but we could a beautiful uh, atmosphere and then the you know the korean town uh, became a, like a destination for weekend right. and everybody came and then even the band the band groups and uh, the performers and they came to uh, you know the enjoy with us like a customers they could um not only eat the food but also what uh, they listen to music and they laugh and it was it was beautiful and we, it was like a festival like a uh, uh, atmosphere and uh, yeah that was the I, I was so proud of uh that's you know, amazing I was the, yeah i'm a korean at the time <laughs> and i hope that uh, this can continue even yeah. though uh, yeah even though uh, <clears throat> the you know we we go back to the normal so for the summertime and fall and spring, and I wish we could continue. Right. I think that um, that that Korean Americans, we are so we're such a fighters, right? Because we never got yeah. anything for free, right? It's not like uh, right, you know, we opened the restaurant <laughs> because uh, you know it's, we never got anything for granted. So I feel like you know, right. honestly, K Town. When I saw you know, I'll go to one job time to eat Korean food, and it was such a refreshing event. Like no other streets was as half or even quarter as vibrant as K-Town because K-Town right. just like it was a big festival such a and it was such a light at the end of the tunnel so thank you just, you know yeah <laughs> thank and you. but how about you Simon um what was it like for you to translate that again sort of the high-end service very you know exquisite level of service um and trans trying to translate that in an outdoor setting was that was that difficult or did it come pretty natural? Yeah. Honestly, so the funny thing is what we, what we didn't mention is a BLM uh, movement that happened. That's right. So, so we cl shut down the restaurant and we're barely going through the uh, uh, delivery and BLM happened, the riot happened. So we had to board up our windows, you know, because there was a riot happening. So we were concerned about that. And then as soon as the governor said we can do outdoor dining and we're obviously at this point out of money what are we supposed to do so we actually took down the the cardboard that we actually put on with the wooden panel we actually took it down and and, and cut it open to uh, build a table and with tables outside <laughs> clever yeah and, and it was ironic uh, but like the table i mean we 
because we were very fast. We actually uh, opened for outdoor dining the day the government governor said to do it. So we didn't have resources. We didn't have any benchmarks. We didn't know what, what's a possibility, the building, the building, the structures. None of these were really kind of possibilities. So we literally put four tables out there, chairs. And, you know, when it rained, there's no cover. So we would get drenched. And I think, honestly, I think that was my saddest moment to see, you know, beverage director of Michelin Star Restaurant and service director of Michelin Star Restaurant who kind of like signed, who, did, who didn't sign up? I mean, obviously no, no one else did, but, um, you know, getting drenched by uh, rain and, you know, making our customers sit on, on top of a asphalt next to, a, you know, a, a sewerage serving, you know, it was, I think at some point I felt like, what is, like, what am I doing here? I think there was that kind of, this is not what I signed up. I think there was a moment where I almost kind of broke down, but um but then the weather was nice and, you know, we got to shake it off and just uh, stay positive. So we started selling fried chicken at a Korean steakhouse. And then uh, that was a big <laughs> hit, froze, and our customers started showing up. And one thing led to another. We started investing more money. And then now we have a pretty awesome setup of outdoor dining. And before you know it, we're, we actually um, bought this um, really nice uh, portable butane. So we're mm -hmm. actually doing, you know, the Korean steakhouse experience. You know, and we bought planters with plants and we had, at, before you know, and we have, we bought speakers, we bought lights. So, you know, fast forward four months, we actually had like, you know, we turned it into, because New York is romantic because only in New York can you do this, right? And, and pandemic actually yeah. brought some sort of a romance to it. So that's how we deal with it. Yeah, it, that is one thing that I do wish as a customer that we get to keep, um, you know, less cars and less honking <laughs> on the streets. And maybe people can actually enjoy the beautiful city that, you know, that is New York City and enjoy the ambience of, you know, people having fun outside together because um, that was, it's such a treat whenever um, we get to experience it. Um, so I guess that's one thing we hope that even when things go back to whatever the normal it will be, um, that we hope that we get to keep. Is there anything you think you may have done differently? Anything you regret doing? Anything you feel like, oh, I should have anticipated this? Or, um, or was it really, as um, you all mentioned, you just had to do things and you just had to keep going. So um, I was just wondering, in hindsight, and we are also, you know, the weather's getting nicer again. Um, is there anything you learned and then you wish um, you would have done differently? How about we start with Simon? Not at all. I have zero regrets, zero. I mean, I, I cannot be that hard on myself nor my, my team. Mm. We survived the storm, uh, all of us, right? Thank you. I mean, I'm so grateful to God, to the team, um, could, could we have done better? I mean, who's asking the question, right? Like seriously, happy to be alive, happy to be here, happy to be on this call with uh, 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 two fellow amazing restaurateurs who also survived. So literally no regrets. Great, that's great to hear. How about you, Christina? <clears throat> if I think only money, then I had to close down. <laughs> that's even better for us. Mm. But as Simon said, I don't regret. I'm a restaurateur. I had to survive with my employees. So I just did. I just kept going and keep going even now. And that's all I could do. So yeah. uh, that's what we did. <laughs> and Ray? Uh, I don't remember. I tried to think what I regret. Uh, so I guess uh, I didn't regret at all. But uh, as uh, Simon said and Christina said, uh, it's a it's a it's a big blast that we still survive and we are still healthy, and we didn't know actually what to do every single day. We just have to just keep moving forward, right? And it's not just to one person that because of a, it's a team team teamwork team member job. So all of the team members they help each other so far, and luckily uh, we are all still here, which I really appreciate, and. During pandemic that I learned is uh, a lot of a small thing that I start to appreciate 
you know, that I just to, um, since I moved here in New York City, that the life was just busy like that. And then I didn't have a chance to go back, just to look back and see what I did. But uh, that was a, uh, for me, a good chance to see not even just my life about the restaurant and what I'm doing and what I'm going to do. So it was, uh, uh, on the other hand, a uh, good opportunity for me to uh, just think over. So, uh, which I appreciate it. And uh, it's uh, March now, and I'm sure that it's going to get better. So let's see. Yeah, let's all hope for that. Um, I wanted to ask you something slightly more serious I, I or uh, more political. I do wonder if all the issues that you are facing um, was particular because you were in New York City. Um, and I was wondering what could have the government, whether it's federal, state, city, your local government, do you think they could have done something differently? And of course, we all understand nobody was prepared for this and they were pro probably flying by the seat of their pants too and trying to figure things out. But since we've gone through this for a year and you know, uh, hopefully things will get better, but based on your experience, what could they have done more or differently? Um, as you all mentioned that you know, you thought there will be some sort of a help um, that really didn't come. Um, how about you, Ray? Was there anything that you feel like that could have been done differently? Uh, now we are talking about politics. <laughs> For me, like, you know, the, uh, it could be better uh, if we, I mean, this is a developed country. So we, they could, they're leaders the people they're sitting at home and they're watching TV. So if they could guide in better way to talk to people about be careful of this, 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 and like the, and in the airport too, uh, some more like the uh, setup to make sure that, you know, they filter out any people who got virus or whatever. Uh, that's what I was thinking too and um, the uh, PPP money or that kind of a government government aid that that's a very grateful, very helpful, but uh, you know, let's say some people, they are, they need more uh, help, right? But I don't think it's, it's communication. You know, they supposed to have a better communication before they execute the plan. So then people who really need more help, they could get more things, you know? But I just to talk to my other friends, not even just friends, like people around. And some people, they're really desperate. But um, like, let's say somebody who has a restaurant on second floor, right? They don't have a main floor. What about the uh, outdoor seatings? And it's a bar only. My friend has a bar second floor. So what, about, what can they, what? of course they can do like uh, Simon did. Uh, Simon, by the way, the boat has a great cocktail. I love that. Oh, but thank you. Even they do the kind of things, but that's not gonna be really enough. And yeah. that kind of a restaurant would have more, much more help. But I don't think the, uh, of course it's uh, reality wise that they cannot just jump into every single restaurant to see what's going on and just to get the more help, right? That's the one thing that I just see and uh, maybe it could be better. Maybe, hopefully it's not happening again, but if they this time learned and they make a plan, and if similar thing happens, then they, I hope that they have a better mm. plan for mm. that. How about you, Christina? Was there anything you wish they could have done better or differently? I mean, as Ray said, the PPP, really helpful. It was really helpful for us, and um, we could have paid the uh, uh, employees and vendors and uh, rent but if the city would do something for like that, then that would be great because until now we didn't get any um, like a physical help from the city mm -hmm. and that would be better. And also um, like a guideline, um, if they would have given us like exact accurate guideline, then um, it, it will be much better because for example, when we had outdoor dining um, we had a lot of inspection every day 
And every inspector gave us a different guidelines and different regulations. So we had to hire like our contractor several times, like four or five times to satisfy the regulation, uh, the, viol the, the violations. So uh, especially it's a hardship, the financially hardship, it was really difficult. And, uh, but they still do it, they still do it today. So I wish they could give us a clear and accurate guideline that would be really helpful. How about you, Simon? Um, anything you wish they'd done? A lot of things or? So much, so much, right? <laughs> I think um, the previous administration really kind of dropped the ball, you know, in mask wearing and, and really it became too politicized, right? Wearing a mask should not be a political thing. In Asia, in Korea, in Japan, China, we wear it all the time through uh, flu season. You know, it's nothing political about it and it became really politicized. So we really couldn't do anything done you know, in, in uniform, but let's put that aside because we can spend a whole day talking about it. But as far as a restaurant is concerned in New York City, I think government really dropped the ball. Um, you know, the, the, the current administration is, has really dropped the ball because, you know, let's face it, right? Christina, right, you all agree. Like we can all go to Korea and open a restaurant and probably put less effort and, and have much more success. The reason why here we're here in New York is we take pride as the, you know, arguably the capital of the world is, you know, we take pride in this as a restaurateur, you know, skyrocketing rent, skyrocketing uh, minimum wage, you know, $15, like, and, you know, health department, fire department, all just busting us down. Why are we here? Because we take pride in this, you know? So we wanted to see some leadership, right? Like if you want to go left, we'll go left. We want to, if you want to go right, I'll go right. It doesn't really matter to me, right? Because I want to, I want to just keep my restaurant open and, and keep paying my employees. That's my only purpose. And I feel like, especially now that I have opened the restaurant in Miami, where we're at 100% occupancy, and New York City, where we're, we're supposed to be very grateful for 35% occupancy. So I feel like New York City, if you want to shut it down, that's fine, right? Like, you know, we're not scientists. I'm sure you're talking to... Um, you know, you got to make a decision. But if you make a de decision to put on a uh, industry specific restrictions, then you're supposed to provide in industry specific relief, right? Because government is supposed to be equitable. You can't just shut restaurants down because we're not an airline industry or this large conglomerate that, that doesn't have a lobbyist group. You know, so I think um, that lack of uh, communication and lack of... Um, you know, as Ray mentioned, there was no communication. We're just scrambling every single time. And there was no industry specific relief. And I think that was a tremendous and tremendous letdown to all, all of us high tax paying um, entrepreneurs to feel like we got completely abandoned. So. And, I agree. <laughs> yeah. And restaurants are such an integral part of what makes New York City New York City, right? So you would think that there will be some more consideration for this business to continue to thrive. Um, and I sincerely hope that's the case. But, and as you mentioned, we still don't know exactly what's going to ha happen. You know, we are hopeful that things will get quote unquote better or um, somewhat back to normal. But looking ahead, um, looking at what's going to happen this summer, what are your assumptions? Um, do you see any signs of change or how do you prepare for this quote unquote new normal? And as exciting as all the outdoor dining is, I'm sure all of you just won, you know, full capacity in your own beautiful restaurants and, and have it filled with actually people who will be coming back to the city. So um, why don't we start with Ray? What are your assumptions as you you know, as we go into, dare I say, the year two of the pandemic and, you know, hope for the best, but what are you preparing for? <clears throat> uh, for sure, it's going to be better. And I can feel that way. That when I go from a uh, 53rd Street location to 43rd Street location in Times Square, uh, more people, obviously. And also, we see some companies, like we used to get catering order from a company in Houston Yard and those mini town. And I see, let's say one company, they used to uh, place an order, like say 20 to 30 boards. Uh, I see that uh, the company's back, but like only two, three people, but you know, few people, they are there. 
So, um, and also, like, as I said, we just to uh, move on for hope that, um, and also we just keep doing the, uh, the, the thing that we supposed to do. That's what I'm doing. And uh, like Times Square tourists, they're gonna come back. This is New York City. And that's the one of the city in the world that everybody wanna come, right? So I'm sure that next year is gonna be better. And two years after it's gonna be better. We don't know when it's gonna go back to 100% normal, but for sure it's getting better little by little by little. So that's what I see uh, the visually. And I think it's gonna be better soon. How about you, Christina? What are you expecting? How are you preparing for this summer? I, I hope that like, uh, like many uh, newspapers and uh, news are saying uh, by June, many, uh, I hope that many people got vaccinated. And then the New Yorkers, uh, like Ray said, the office workers, and then the tourists um, then slowly come back to New York. And then uh, that make uh, the small businesses moving. Um, so uh, that's what I hope. And if, um, you know, what we do for the new normal is the, uh, we are just like a preparing, um, um, like we, we have a basic like principles, like convenient, the good food, good service in a comfortable uh, setting. But we added like safety. That's the uh, most um, important issue for nowadays. So uh, we have all uh, all tables that have the, the dividers, like each table has the dividers, and also we change the uh, the ventilation uh, filters, um, you know, based on the the government guidelines. And also we educate our uh, uh, the staff uh, the importance of hygiene. And those are the things we are doing. And we are changing also the barbecue systems and also the, the side dishes because our side dishes is a shared side dishes, but we are doing a, like individual side dish plates. And those are the things. And we're just keep, uh, you know, um, changing and adapt and uh, just keep going. <laughs> yeah, That's what we're doing. And how about you, Simon? What are you, what are your plans for this summer? Oh. So I think, first of all, I think mayoral run is going to be, mayoral race is going to be very, very important, you know. Um, obviously, I shouldn't be um, uh, pushing anyone, but um, I, I'm pushing for Asian-American leader uh, who can actually see, uh, you know, clearly with a data-driven, mathematic-driven thing. And I think this, uh, more than ever, I think uh, our who becomes our mayor is more important than ever. So I think that's the first thing that we need to really kind of uh, focus on. And the second is, you know, next few months is still going to be tough, right? Because we are out of money. Uh, even the second PPP is coming. We're scarred. We're tired. We're just kind of like fatigued. You know, this is like never ending nightmare uh, that's about to end, you know? So I think this, which is a, you know, kind of sadistic way like this, it's a, it's a, there's something to hope for right now, right? So we survived the, the worst of it. So in my humble opinion, the summer of 2021 in New York City for Dining World, I think it's going to be fantastic. I actually, dare I uh, predict, because I'm an optimist, because I don't actually see fantastic being numbers that we did 2019, right? Because I think, um, you know, it's going to take time until the office is reopened and whatnot. So I think it's very important that we actually manage our expectation so that, you know, if I 75% of 2019, I think that's fantastic, right? If the restaurant is filled, we may not have corporate diners drop, you know, swiping their corporate cards and do these kind of uh, things that, that used to happen. But if we position ourselves because we learn how to run a restaurant much more prudently, hopefully, Christina, your landlord will understand that the previous 24-hour uh, <laughs> uh, revenues, that rent is not possible, you know? So hopefully we can so. all kind of reduce that. <clears throat> and then... Um, even though we might be a 75% of number, maybe it's 125%, who knows, right? But I feel like uh, we can be optimistic. And I surely hope that is the case. And personally, <laughs> I cannot wait. Um, I do go to the city, I think, I feel like once a month and I make sure that I go to visit all my favorite restaurants because like every time I pass by, I'm like, please don't tell me you're closed. You're, please don't tell me you're closed. So I 
you know, so hope that that is the case for you. And um, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for now. And, you know, we could have talked yeah. for another hour or so about all this. But <laughs> thanks again um, for time joining flies. us tonight, Christina, Simon and Thank Ray. You. Um, Thank it was you so such, much. It was so great to see you all. Um, I'll bite virtually. Um, stay healthy. Um, and personally, I just can't wait to visit your restaurants and hang out again. So special thanks to Peter, our IT director, for making this live webcast you, a possibility. Thank and you. to our intern, Jia and Hiju, for getting all the questions Thank and doing you, email yeah. outreach and social media postings. And of course, our thanks to you, our members and viewers. We hope you'll join us again. Check out what's coming up on the website, koreasociety.org, or subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thank you and good night. Thank you. Thank you Thank so you. much. Have a good night, guys. Bye. See ya. Bye.